This is Sally Schessler, Director of Education for Allergy and Asthma Network, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Advances in Allergy and Asthma. This webinar series is presented in partnership with the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. This webinar series helps the network live out our mission to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. Today, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Leonard McCarrier, who will speak to us today about <laughs> asthma in the yellow zone. Dr. McCarrier is the Janie Robinson and John Moore Lee Chair in Pediatrics, Professor in Pediatrics at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Section Chief of Pediatric Allergy and Immunology, Scientific Director of the Center for Clinical and Translational Research, and Director of the Center for Pediatric Asthma Research. Dr. McCarrier is a pediatric allergist and immunologist with extensive experience in pediatric asthma research, particularly clinical trials. He has led and participated in multiple federally funded multi-center clinical trials in childhood asthma. He has over 200 peer-reviewed manuscripts derived from these projects. He is the sole American pediatrician on the Global Initiative for Asthma Science Committee and serves as an associate editor for the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, as well as editor of the two leading textbooks in the field of allergy and immunology. Dr. Bacarrier, thank you so much for being with us today. We look forward to benefiting from your expertise. Thank you so much, Sally, and, and to everyone for the opportunity to join this webinar series, which I know provides valuable clinically uh, relevant discussion items around uh, the areas of asthma and allergic disease. Um, here are my uh, financial disclosures. I don't believe that any of them are going to directly impact um, today's discussion. So we're going to talk today about the yellow zone, this transition zone of asthma control. When patients go from a well-controlled state of disease and begin to show evidence of loss of short-term control, there is an emergence of symptoms, and this generally occurs outside of the medical setting. In other words, it usually occurs at home, at school, um, while traveling, et cetera. Um, and the goal when this yellow zone emerges is to quickly return to the green zone, to regain control and to prevent progression of symptoms and deterioration of, of clinical status to the red zone, which is usually a point at which additional interventions such as oral corticosteroids and healthcare utilization usually enter the picture. So our goal here is to better identify this transition zone, help our patients understand what to do um, in that uh, period of time where they might be able to change the course of their loss of asthma control, and then hopefully uh, prevent progression to red zone and return to green zone. Much of what we're gonna discuss today can be found in a document that I was uh, privileged to be part of as uh, part of a practice parameter called Management of Acute Loss of Asthma Control in the Yellow Zone. Um, we published this in 2014 in the Annals of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, and much of what was in there still holds to be true. However, in the seven years that have elapsed, there's been uh, substantial um, development in this area. So while some of the topics we'll discuss are directly from this document, some are not found there because they're more recent um, and I think are uh, quite important for our patients. And as part of this document, we had a series of summary statements. Some of these we'll go through quickly. Some of these we'll spend a little more time on. The first one is, is the acknowledgement that asthma action plans are important. They tend to follow this traffic light model of green, yellow, and red zones, and that action plans should be part of asthma care. They should be provided in a written and or electronic format, and it should include instructions for, to help patients recognize that they've lost control and provide a plan for what to do when that occurs. Simple, straightforward concept but as all these things, the devil remains in the details. Our second summary statement was that we should instruct our patients to activate this yellow zone when there's an acute loss of control. And this loss of control or yellow zone 
could be defined in a variety of ways, and many patients will show different symptom patterns depending on their age, their disease course, their degree of severity. It's generally defined as some combination of an increase in symptoms and or an increased use of reliever medication for patients for whom peak flow monitoring is part of their management plan, a drop in peak flow of at least 15% or so, or below 80% of their personal best. Although this has, I think, fallen less and less um, in favor over time. And it's important to remember that nocturnal awakenings for some patients are a clear indicator of beginning to lose asthma control, and therefore any change in uh, nocturnal symptoms might be an indication of yellow zone activity. So thinking about an increase of use in reliever medication, you need to really think about the patient's baseline symptom frequency. And some patients will require rescue in the green zone. But to me, the green zone means you got one short acting beta agonist treatment and you are back to normal. That doesn't mean yellow zone. A single rescue is not the yellow zone. However, symptoms that persist or fail to respond to one or more treatments or recur within four hours of a rescue is an indicator that yellow zone has been entered and uh, should be thought about and dealt with. And red zone is really when symptoms don't resolve even with repetitive short-acting beta agonist treatments. So what are our indicators of the yellow zone? Here's a little more data to help us think this through. So peak flows, if these are monitored in a sequential way, historically there seems to be a gradual decline within the five to seven days that precede the episode, but really this starts to occur within the two to three days before symptom peak. And then symptoms increase and SABA use increase, and they increase in a very similar pattern um, to peak flows. The peak flows seem to be more specific, but the symptom scores seem to be more sensitive when it comes to this. But the important takeaway point is that these changes tend to occur in parallel. And none of these measures historically provides an earlier warning of an exacerbation than do the others. So you really have to understand your individual patient because one of these um, may not be their best indicator. They may need to think of these in aggregate. Next summary statement is to instruct patients to activate their yellow zone at the onset of a cold if this is a previously known trigger because we know that this is a very common trigger for patients. And the cold-driven exacerbations tend to give you a bit of a window in time between onset of symptoms and progression to lower respiratory tract disease and substantial exacerbation. So using colds as, an, as a yellow zone criterion are really important, particularly in younger children. And this has been studied in a variety of approaches with varying degrees of success, and we'll discuss some of these as we go. But the, the takeaway point is that recommending that parents of young children, especially, when they see the onset of a cold, they should be thinking this is an impending asthma exacerbation, and that this should potentially get them into yellow zone actions even if the typical chest symptoms have not yet developed. Allergic triggers often are responsible for exacerbation. Many patients are gonna tell us that they can identify an allergic exposure prior to onset of uh, loss of control. There are very little data to tell us how to deal with this because these are, these, these are sporadic, you can't really control for them. But I think it, it's fair to say that in those in whom an allergic exposure is a known trigger, maybe that should be your yellow zone criterion. So the, son, so the child who visits grandma every Sunday and spends time with grandma's cat and dog, who then every Sunday night needs one or two rescue treatments, that child should be thought of as being in the yellow zone before they go to grandma's house. And some step up in care be in, implemented to try to prevent that from occurring. So how long might the yellow zone last? Here are some uh, additional ways that we can sort of think about this. 
The yellow zone is variable. Symptoms can return to baseline sooner than lung function does. So patients tend to have a symptom resolution prior to a return to baseline lung function. Typically peak flows, at least in adults, are gonna be back to within to baseline within about 14 days with or without oral steroids. And therefore, if we're gonna make yellow zone recommendations, maybe they need to be more than a few days in duration. Maybe they need to last for up to a couple of weeks, realizing that patients may not fully be back to their baseline in all respects um, within just a couple of days, even if their symptoms start getting better. On the right are some data from a trial that we did in children, looking at the development of symptoms around exacerbations, looking at the onset of timing of cough and wheeze, rescue albuterol, and morning peak flow. And what you see is that there is a relatively sharp uptake, you know, two or three days before symptom peak, and then a return to baseline over the next two weeks. And this occurs for the symptom complex, it occurs for rescue albuterol use, and it occurs for morning peak flow. So if you are in the yellow zone, you may not fully be back to baseline uh, for a, a two week period of time. When we think about what we want to accomplish by yellow zone maneuvers, it's really about prompt recognition and initiation. And my stance on this has always been that a false start is preferred over a late start. You would rather have started whatever your yellow zone maneuver is and found out you didn't need it, than waited too long and realized that your yellow zone is now a red zone episode. So I encourage folks to really think about early starts um, rather than late starts because the consequences of, of waiting can be substantial. Our next summary statement was to instruct patients to escalate asthma therapy when they experience a loss of asthma control that puts them in the quote unquote yellow zone. Now, how to do this is basically the rest of our discussion. And what you'll see is that there are some strategies that we do that work. There are some strategies that we use that may not work. And there are some that we just don't know how to, to really put into play um, at present. So if we think about step-up approaches to prevent exacerbations, what you have here is a typical exacerbation curve like we've been looking at. Over time, the patient has a gradual and then increasing um, intensity of symptoms. They peak and then they begin to come down either spontaneously or with augmented therapy. And the goal of everything we want to accomplish here is to shift this curve to the left. We want to reduce the maximal intensity of the episode, and we want to get the patients back to their steady state baseline as quickly as possible. And the variety of ways that we can go after this. We can augment their long-term therapy because we know that controller therapy reduces exacerbation risk and severity. And if these episodes are occurring at a sufficient frequency, a step up in long-term management is probably indicated. For the purposes of today's discussion, we're really gonna focus on more short-term interventions. Those that could be triggered when the patient enters the yellow zone or the use of rescue inhaled corticosteroids, maybe a little before the yellow zone, such as in young children with viral dominant disease. So here are some potential yellow zone strategies. Repetitive use of short acting beta agonists, schedule dosing step up, in other words, increasing your inhaled corticosteroid dose, or a dynamic dosing step up using inhaled corticosteroid and relievers with either a SABA or a long acting beta agonist. And we'll talk about these um, uh, in sequence. But I think the first thing to keep in mind is that the first one, the one that is universally recommended, use more SABA, has evidence level C, not very good. This has actually not been well studied, and there is no compelling evidence that this actually prevents exacerbations. This is the strategy to help people have less symptoms, but whether this is actually an effective strategy to prevent red zone emergence is uh, not determined. We advise our patients to use short acting beta agonist at a dose of two to four puffs every four to six hours in the yellow zone. In addition, 
to their escalated yellow zone treatment. If this use exceeds 12 puffs per day, we recommend that they contact the provider for further guidance. Again, no real good data to support this. This is almost general consensus. We advise patients who are currently treated with low to moderate dose inhaled corticosteroids to consider increasing this dose, um, such as a quadrupling for the management of asthma control. When we wrote this document in 2014, this was evidence level B. What I'll show you is that we're, I'm not so sure this statement, if we rewrote this document today, would even be included, and it almost certainly would not be included for children. So, so how do we think this through? So here are the, the NAEPP recommendations for the yellow zone. They recommend that we provide a written action plan that includes the increased use of Saba for symptom control. It no longer recommends a doubling of inhaled corticosteroids because that has never been demonstrated to be an effective strategy. And quadrupling of the inhaled corticosteroid may be recommended. In contrast, the GINA document in endorses a potential increase of inhaled steroids in the yellow zone, but only in adolescents and adults and not in children under the age of 12. Where does this all come from? So, Here's really the first study that tried to get at this. this is the study of doubling the dose of inhaled corticosteroids to prevent exacerbations. Patients 16 or older receiving inhaled corticosteroids at baseline and either oral steroid or they had a doubling dose within the past year. So they had had a history of exacerbations. They were told to double their inhaled steroid or their placebo was added for 14 days if they had a 15% decline in peak flow or their symptoms scored had increased over baseline. They looked at the proportion of patients who needed oral corticosteroids and they found absolutely no difference. There was no effect here between those who doubled their inhaled corticosteroids and those who did not. What about quadrupling the dose? Maybe doubling just isn't enough. So here's another study now about 12 years old, patients 16 and older on inhaled corticosteroids. And if their asthma, was deteriorating or they had a cold or they had a peak flow drop of 15% or they had a 30% drop in one day, they were told to either in a randomized way, continue their asthma, usual asthma therapy or they quadrupled their use of inhaled corticosteroid. And they looked at oral steroid requiring exacerbations. And in the overall study, they found no effect. These are the patients who quadrupled. These are the patients who, who did not. It went 19% and 14%. Those are not statistically different. However, if they did a um, per protocol analysis and they looked at patients who actually quadrupled, because a lot of people didn't, despite the fact they should have, they actually showed about a 57% reduction in the risk of needing oral, oral steroids. So this was viewed as a positive but um, questionable result because it was a post hoc secondary analysis. So this was recently followed up by this pragmatic unblinded randomized trial. So this was a study of nearly 2,000 adults and adolescents in primary care receiving inhaled corticosteroids at a variety of doses. They had had an exacerbation in the prior year and their self-management plan was either an open label quadrupling of their baseline steroid dose or not. And they were told to do this with all such exacerbation or all such yellow zones over the, the next year. And their outcome was the time to their first severe exacerbation. And what they saw is among those who did not quadruple the dose, about 52% had an exacerbation in the first year. And those who quadrupled, though, was 45%. That was a statistically significant about 20% reduction with a number needed to treat a 15, meaning that if you did this strategy for 15 patients for a year, you would prevent one patient from having a prednisone requiring exacerbation. Now, the point to be taken away from this is these patients were on an awful lot of inhaled corticosteroid to begin with. Their median baseline dose was 800 micrograms a day. So a quadrupling, I'm sorry about that, a quadrupling meant that their dose went up to 32 100 micrograms a day for seven to 14 days. And not surprising when you give that much topical steroid, there was a higher frequency of adverse events such as oral candidiasis or dysphonia. But this supports that at least in adolescents and adults receiving this type of therapy, a quadrupling does provide some degree of exacerbation reduction, 
but it's pretty modest and there's there are some side effect consequences to keep in mind. We asked a similar question in school age children, age five to 11, who were um, appropriate candidates for daily low dose inhaled corticosteroid therapy. So these are children with mild persistent asthma who should receive daily low dose inhaled corticosteroids. They all had an exacerbation in the prior year requiring oral steroids. And we randomized them to receive one of two approaches. One group we called low dose inhaled corticosteroid. They were maintained on the same dose of inhaled corticosteroid, fluticasone 44, two puffs twice a day, every day. And when they went in the yellow zone, they continued on that dose in a blinded fashion. The high dose group received the same 44 micrograms twice a day, every day. But when they went into the yellow zone based on an electronic diary that, that looked at medication use and rest and symptoms, if they had yellow zone, their inhaler was switched in a blinded fashion to fluticasone 220, two puffs twice a day. So a five-fold increase in their inhaled steroid dose, and this was continued for seven days. And we looked at exacerbations per year in the two groups. And what we saw was that in the low dose group, the group that did not augment therapy in the yellow zone, they had about 0.37 exacerbations per patient per year. The children who were in the high dose group actually had numerically more exacerbations than did the low dose group. The relative rate was actually 1.3, so 30% higher rate in the children who quintupled versus those who did not. It's a statistically non-significant difference. We found no differences in the rate of exacerbation between the two groups at all. We saw no difference in symptom scores or albuterol use during the episodes. So even if prednisone wasn't the right outcome, the symptom rates were the same and the albuterol use rates were the same. There was no difference between the groups in emergency or urgent care. There was no difference in the rates of, of treatment failures. And there were four hospitalizations that occurred dur during the course of the study, and all of them were actually in the high dose group. We didn't see any significant adverse events between the low dose and the high dose groups in terms of side effects, so that was good. We looked at cumulative steroid exposure, both inhaled and oral, and the high dose group actually got more total steroid by 16% than did the um, uh, low dose group. And the high dose group actually, despite this, grew 0.23 centimeters less than did the children who received the low dose. So there was actually a growth signal in the adverse direction for high dose inhaled corticosteroid use. So we don't believe that this is a strategy that is effective or appropriate in children um, with uncontrolled asthma, whose asthma is now entering the yellow zone. So these are the, the latest GINA guidelines for how to think about um, rescue therapy. And what I point out here in the three uh, uh, highlighted boxes is this concept of using inhaled corticosteroid for Motorol as a reliever therapy in children 6 to 11 in those who um, require or are appropriate candidates for um, this approach. And we'll talk a bit more about this as we go. And in adults, and adolescents 12 and above, the now current preferred reliever is as needed low dose inhaled corticosteroid for Motorol, even in patients who have mild asthma and who may not need daily therapy. And where does all this come from? Well, before we get there, we'll look at the new NIH recommendations that came out in late 2020. And they're very consistent in this and that they're recommending combination and as needed low dose inhaled corticosteroid for Motorol as the maintenance and reliever approach in steps three and four for children as young as five. And in patients 12 and older, it actually goes down as low as step two in terms of using low dose inhaled corticosteroid and as needed SABA or as needed ICS and SABA. So for patients with mild to moderate asthma, we are going to consider recommending symptom-driven use of inhaled corticosteroids with concomitant beta agonists for control of yellow zone symptoms. This was evidence level B in, 2020, in 2014. It's probably closer to evidence level A today. And a lot of this is based on the two trials that are called SIGMA 1 and 2. 
And what these studies are, are two trials of patients with mild asthma. These are patients who did not need, uh, have to receive daily controller therapy. And they were studied to see which approach would work best at the reduction of exacerbations. As needed, terbutaline, which is an albuterol equivalent, as needed, budesonide for motorol, given whenever the patients had symptoms and needed rescue. And in sigma-1, those were um, also compared to daily low-dose budesonide, 200 micrograms once a day. In sigma-2, there was no as-needed terbutaline arm. There were just a comparison of as-needed budesonide for motorol versus twice-daily budesonide as maintenance therapy. And in sigma-1, what's absolutely clear is that in these patients with mild asthma, the use of budesonide for motorol just as needed for, exacer for symptoms, in other words, yellow zone, reduced the risk of exacerbation by 64% compared to those patients who received just the SABA as needed. And in their time to first exacerbation, the patients, again, who, were, who received as needed terbutaline were significantly more likely to have an exacerbation requiring oral steroids than those who received either budesonide for motorol as rescue or budesonide as maintenance therapy. Sigma-2 compared the two drugs to each other and found that as needed, budesonide for motorol was non-inferior to regular inhaled corticosteroids for severe exacerbations. So that using these two strategies produced very comparable effects. Um, in these patients. And here's a recent uh, systematic review and meta-analysis of patients receiving um, more uh, substantial therapy, in other words, maintenance and reliever therapy. And it concludes that SMART was associated with a reduced risk of exacerbations compared to the same dose of ICS LABA as controller, as well as compared to a higher dose of ICS with LABA or ICS alone. And this held true even as young as age four, with this approach being associated with the reduced risk of exacerbation compared to a higher dose of ICS or the same dose of ICS plus LABA. So the concept of using an ICS plus formoterol as your reliever instead of albuterol reduces the risk of exacerbation and really supports it as a yellow zone strategy. When we think about it, people are often curious as to how much of this we can use and how to use it. The recommendation is that as needed for ICS for Motorol is usually prescribed in the form of budesonide for Motorol, 200 over six as the meter dose, which is effectively 160 over 4.5 as a delivered dose. And we recommend this as one inhalation as needed. Maximum daily dose of Motorol is 72 micrograms, 54 as deliver dose on any one day. In other words, a maximum of 12 inhalations per day. So when we compare the GINA strategy and the NAEPP strategy, we see that the preferred reliever, and when do we use reliever? Predominantly for symptoms in yellow zone, differs between the two sets of guidelines and it differs by age group. And I think it's important to start keeping this in mind because it means that not all asthma action plans are going to read exactly the same. For some people, their yellow zone rescue should be a SABA. For some, it very well could and should be a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid for Motorol product. So I think keeping these in mind is essential. And it's, it's another step toward personalizing the care that we deliver and that not all asthmatics should be treated the same way in, all, in, in every circumstance. So I just want to spend a few minutes talking about preschool episodic wheeze, early life or current wheeze, because I think these children have a slightly different set of challenges. And um, I think we now have data to help us make good decisions on their care. So one strategy that has been studied now for quite a while is these are children who don't have symptoms on a day-to-day -day basis, but when they get a cold, they actually have pretty substantial episodes. And these are children that I term as severe episodic viral triggered wheeze. And what folks have studied for a long time is whether you can start a high dose of inhaled corticosteroid at the starting of a cold when these children usually start to have emergence of symptoms and whether this therapy would be effective in reducing their risk of exacerbation. 
And there have been a couple of studies that have addressed this well. I'll share one of them with you here. This is the study by Francine Ducharme and colleagues in Canada. 129 children, one to six years of age, with recurrent wheezing, but no intermittent or intercurrent symptoms. They'd needed prednisone in the past six months for an exacerbation, and they tried to exclude allergic children from this trial to really focus on viral triggered um, disease. Triple blind placebo controlled trial, and when the parents noted that the child started having a cold, they began the study drug, which was either very high dose fluticasone. 1,500 micrograms twice, I'm sorry, 750 micrograms twice daily or placebo. And this was continued until the child was, had no symptoms of cough or wheeze or albuterol need. And their primary outcome was the group rate of oral corticosteroid use. And what they found was a 50% reduction in the risk of oral steroids in the children who received the fluticasone compared to those who received placebo. They saw no difference in the proportion of children or a proportion of illnesses that had wheezing, cough, dyspnea, or hospitalization. Fluticasone use was a short, associated with a shorter duration of albuterol use, but this very high dose of fluticasone had a growth effect and in, a, in terms of both height and weight. And it was felt that this combination of adverse effects actually outweighed to some extent the positive effects of oral corticosteroid requirements. And this study in the end recommended against this therapy because the risk benefit balance um, seemed to favor the risk. We took a slightly different approach and we compared high dose inhaled corticosteroids at the onset of a cold in the same way as was done in the prior study. But instead of treating the second group with placebo, we treated them with daily low dose inhaled corticosteroids. So we took at-risk children with recurrent wheeze who had underlying allergic features and had a recent exacerbation and treated them either with budesonide a half a milligram once daily in the evening or placebo once daily in the evening. And then the intervention was to either continue the low dose budesonide during the yellow zone during signs of respiratory tract illness or to increase the budesonide exposure to a milligram twice daily and do this for seven days in the context of this viral illness. And we did this study fully expecting to see that the daily low dose approach would, be, would have been the superior strategy based on the literature. And we did not find that at all. We actually found that the two therapies were exactly the same. They had comparable rates of exacerbation requiring oral steroids. They had comparable rates of episode days and episode free days, both during and outside of colds. There was no difference in albuterol use, prednisone use, healthcare utilization, or growth. But what we found is that when you use this intermittent strategy, those children actually had one third the, the corticosteroid exposure than did the children who received daily therapy. So in children who don't have uh, persistent symptoms, but have viral trigger disease, especially in the pre here in the preschool age group, this is a therapy that reduced the risk. Um, comparable to that of daily inhaled corticosteroids. And it's a strategy that resonates with many parents. But again, you have to be cautious and assure that the parents understand that we don't wanna do this more often than is necessary. We only wanna do it for seven days. And we need to understand when and if this therapy isn't being effective. So the, the final approach I wanna share is a study that we did that asked the question if azithromycin a macrolide antibiotic would reduce the risk of exacerbations in these same type of children. Because what we saw is that inhaled corticosteroids were not perfect. At high doses, maybe associated with some growth effects. And no one had ever studied whether this therapy would be effective in low risk atopic, non-atopic children. So we did a randomized controlled trial of azithromycin, 12 milligrams per kilogram per day or placebo once daily for five days. The parents were again instructed to begin this therapy at the onset of a cold and continue it until um, the uh, uh, first for the five days. Albuterol was given four times daily for 48 hours, and we continued this study for 52 to 78 weeks. And the children could have had three or four illnesses, but if they had an illness that pro progressed to oral steroid requirement, their study participation ended. There were 12 to 71 months of age who had recurrent clinically significant wheezing in the past year. These are the definitions that we used. And these are basically children who are having severe episodic wheeze. 
um, and they required either systemic steroids, unscheduled visit, ED visit or hospitalization in the prior year. So the children could have been treated during a first, a second, a third, and or a fourth episode. So among children randomized to placebo, there were about 300 in each group. 220 had a first illness, 22 of which progressed to severe illness um, requiring oral steroids. 147 children had a second illness, 19 of which progressed to severe episode, 74 had a third, nine of whom progressed, and 23 had a fourth, seven of whom progressed. So there were a total of 57 severe illnesses in the placebo group. In the azithromycin group, the first thing you'll notice is that they had essentially the exact same number of, we of severe illnesses um, at each given, at, I'm sorry, uh, so same number of illnesses at any given point, 220 versus 223, 147 versus 146, 74, 78, 23, 26. But the number and proportion that progressed to severe illnesses is lower at every time point. So there were only 35 in the, in the active group who progressed. This resulted in a 36% reduction in the risk of having an exacerbation requiring oral steroid among patients who received azithromycin or oligan therapy. We found no difference between children who were API positive and API negative, identifying this as a strategy that was effective in both groups. And despite the fact that we believe that most of these illnesses were triggered by virus, um, we found that if you had concomitant evidence of rhinoviral infection, you actually experienced the greatest response to azithromycin. So it isn't that we were treating non-viral illnesses with this therapy. So we concluded that azithromycin, if started early in the course of an illness, was effective in reducing the risk of experiencing an exacerbation. We saw no difference in response by API status, and we found that this was well tolerated. So it gives us an additional strategy to consider. So what we've seen today, and this is a, a recent review um, that I think it is really on the mark. So I'm using their key messages as our conclusions today. And their key messages are that there's no specific evidence that suggests that scheduled SABA can prevent an exacerbation. We've seen that. We've seen strong evidence that supports intermittent ICS dosing for preschool aged children with intermittent viral induced wheeze. We've seen that short term doubling of inhaled corticosteroids seems to be ineffective, whereas results have been mixed for more substantial increases, such as quadrupling and quintupling. We've seen the evidence that dynamic dosing appears to be the most promising because this symptom-driven inhaled corticosteroid use in tandem with rescue beta agonist use, whether this is in the form of a short-acting or long-acting rapid onset beta agonist, seems to result in a decrease in exacerbations while minimizing inhaled corticosteroid exposure. That the GINA guidelines now recommend a step one control for patients 12 and above as needed low-dose ICS for Motorol, and this is also an option as step two controller or low-dose ICS whenever SAB is taken. And that Gina now recommends as-needed low-dose ICS for Motorol as a preferred reliever for all steps of asthma care. So I think what we've seen is that there has been a substantial evolution in our data, our evidence, and our understanding of how to manage patients in the yellow zone. I think we have a variety of strategies. These strategies need to be tailored to the specific patient in the specific clinical situation. I think we've seen that not all age groups behave the same way and not all patients behave the same way. So we need to personalize our approach. Once one asthma action plan does not fit all of our patients and depending on the clinical situations, you will probably devise a slightly different approach for the majority of uh, our patients. But I think what we're seeing is that we have strategies that are effective in the yellow zone. We have strategies that are not, and they should be avoided. Um, but I think these are the keys to, to improving self-efficacy, improving self-management, um, reducing exacerbation risk, and therefore keeping our patients as healthy as possible. So I'll be glad to, uh, to stop there. Please, if you have questions, enter them into the box on the webinar control panel, and we'll go through as many of these as we can in the next few minutes. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Becarrier. This has been a great presentation, and uh, I think that we've all probably learned a lot. We do have questions today. 
Our first question is, what is the yellow zone for people with asthma? And what can someone in the yellow zone do to prevent falling into the red zone or developing severe asthma symptoms that require medical assistance? So the yellow zone is that first indication that short-term asthma control is deteriorating, that patients are starting to have increased asthma symptom frequency, drop in peak flow, increase in uh, rescue albuterol use or nocturnal awakenings. Patients need to be well informed that these are signs that worsening asthma may be on the horizon and that they need to be given a written predetermined strategy for what to do in those situations. There's a multitude of strategies that have been studied, some of which are more effective than others. Um, they all include an augmentation of rescue medication use. Some of them may include augmentation of inhaled corticosteroids or other therapies, depending on the age of the patient, the type of disease, the severity and the background medication use. But I think the key is that patients need to be instructed to acknowledge and recognize these early signs of loss of control and have strategies available to them so that they can deal with them short of having to uh, seek emergent uh, care. Thank you so much. Uh, what are the signs, uh, the asthma signs, that would tell a patient that they need to seek medical help? Yeah, so it, these are the, the signs of asthma that are clearly impacting um, respiratory function. So persistent cough that won't stop, wheezing, profound chest tightness, and then the very worrisome signs of fingers and lips turning blue, inability to speak in complete sentences, um, fatigue, sleepiness, um, all of those are, are very, very worrisome um, signs and should prompt emergent um, evaluation. Thank you so much. Our next question comes from Tammy. Tammy asks, for those children who have environmental allergies to pollens, cottonwood, grasses, et cetera, would it be recommended to begin treatment that would be similar to those that have an upper respiratory tract infection trigger? That's a very good question. It's a very difficult question to ask, to answer, because those exposures tend to be more um, persistent. <clears throat> Pollen exposures, you know, are, are four, six, eight weeks in duration. Um, so it's not so clear that um, entering the yellow zone in anticipation of something that's going to last um, for four to six weeks is the greatest strategy. There was one study that, that examined increasing inhaled corticosteroids prior to children returning to school in the fall season compared to leaving their inhaled corticosteroid dose alone. And there was no benefit in terms of exacerbation protection from doing that. So I think we you have to sort of keep the, the exposures in context. I think if you have a patient who clearly has a problem in the, in the pollen season, you wanna talk about preemptive strategies to, to maximize their control, but the specifics of exactly how to do that are really not well worked out. There are some intuitive strategies that for any given patient may or may not be effective. I wish I had a more uh, concrete answer for the question. Oh, don't worry. Our listeners ask lots of difficult questions. <laughs> Here's the next one. This one is, uh, seems that many doctors are not using peak flow meters with children. What would be the rationale for not using a peak flow meter? Yeah, so I think peak flow meters in my practice are almost non-existent. I think, first of all, the result you get from a peak flow meter is only as good as the result the child wants to give you. Um, we, it is totally effort dependent. So the child who does not give a full effort gives an, an, a result that can generate concern when it need not. As we've seen, peak flows are actually no more um, predictive of decline than are symptom-based. There have been many studies that have compared peak flow-based action plans to non-peak flow-containing action plans, and they behave very similarly. So I, unless you have a patient who has very poor perception of airflow obstruction, people who don't know that their airflow is down, who come into your office, they're wheezing, and they have no idea that they're wheezing, 
other than patients like that, I usually don't recommend peak flows because I think sometimes it gives them distraction. Some children, the, the maneuver of doing multiple peak flows can worsen their bronchoconstriction. So it, it, to me, it doesn't provide most patients with any additional information than they would have gotten had they just been paying attention to symptoms alone. Thank you very much for that. Our next question is, when quadrupling a dose, does that affect growth? So what we saw in, in children six to 11 is that the quintupling did indeed impact growth. And it did it with no benefit in terms of exacerbation reduction. So I do not recommend it in patients who are um, under the age of 12. The studies of adolescents and adults that have suggested that a, quint that a quadrupling may reduce the risk of exacerbation, were studying just that, adolescents and adults. So growth was never measured or studied. So in adolescents who are still growing, it's impossible to know what effect it may or may not have. But in children, we've shown that a quintupling of the low dose, um, even in the short term, does have a measurable growth effect um, with no clinical benefits. So we recommend against it. Okay. Our next question is, elementary school age children re often return to the nurse's station after recess due to in uh, poor outdoor air quality. Air quality seems to be a trigger. Would it be appropriate to administer a SABA prior to recess? Would that be recommended? Um, it's impossible to know what the right answer is. I, you rec I would recommend a SABA before recess if the child comes in after recess consistently needing SABA rescue. I think whether it's poor air quality or exercise or a combination of the two, if you have a patient who tends to experience asthma-related symptoms during recess, I would pre-treat them to prevent those episodes. Just like any other set of circumstances, be it soccer practice, um, if you have a situation that you know will provoke symptoms, pre-treatment is um, a very rational therapy. There's a lot of evidence that suggests now that ICS for Motorol used as pretreatment for exercise is just as effective as albuterol when used as pretreatment for exercise. So these are sort of newer strategies that may help um, reduce the rate at which patients have loss of control and, and yellow zone episodes. So I think you, you, you look at the broader context and you make the decision based on what you think the factors are. Well, and just as another help for people that, uh, that, that either work in schools or find that they personally are very affected by air quality, uh, we have an index now on the homepage of our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org, and it says Allergy and Asthma Index. If you click on that, you can put in your zip code and the date. It can be today or it can be in a month when you're having a big event, and it will tell you what the allergy range is and asthma range, uh, as well as what the flu is expected to be for, you know, the flu indices are expected to be. So you can get some of those answers. And so if you know a child struggles, you know, if, if at, on certain days, you can check to see if it's going to be a high impact asthma day or not. So that's just something that might be able to help you. Okay, Don asks us, what do you think of using pheno testing to monitor asthma control in addition to symptoms? Um, it, it's certainly helpful um, in the right circumstance. The challenge is that um, if it's not something our patients can do at home on a day-to-day -day basis, and most yellow zone episodes are going to occur at home during routine um, life. So it's it's not a strategy that I think is is ready to be put into sort of the patient level de um, devices. There, some have studied this. I, I'm telling you the results are just not as impressive as you would think. Whether it's sensitive enough in the short term to, predict, to identify some worsening, I, I don't think that's been well demonstrated to date. I think using it in the office to identify patients who have persistent type two inflammation, who might need additional therapy or might need um, improved um, efforts toward adherence of inhaled corticosteroids. It certainly has a role there, 
but whether it um, will have a role in identifying yellow zone entry and therefore um, helping patients make their next treatment decision. I don't think we're there yet, and the studies that have been done to me don't suggest that it's likely to be a terribly effective strategy, unfortunately. I wish it were. It's, a, it's another one of those great ideas. Just like peak flows monitor twice a day, we're going to be great at identifying this. And once we got all of our patients to do twice a day peak flows, we were going to get rid of exacerbations. And that just did not turn out to be the case, despite it being a very valid hypothesis. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, our next question is, are the Formoterol ICS combination meds best delivered with the help of a spacer or chamber? So the ones available, so the only one available in the United States is available as a meter dose inhaler and our general recommendation is that they be delivered using a, 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 a spacer um, with appropriate uh, either mouthpiece or face mask depending on the age of the child. Um, it's important to note that that's, you know, that's a general belief system. These drugs and all the clinical trials that have used these strategies all did them without valve holding chambers. The drug is approved at baseline without use of a valve holding chamber. So if you have a patient who can learn excellent technique without one, and you feel very comfortable with that, it is a strategy that has been demonstrated to be effective but the addition of them, we believe, improves deposition, reduces the risk of hand-eye discoordination, and will hopefully help patients uh, achieve maximal benefit. Okay, the next question is, are there any studies that show the long-term use of corticosteroids causing decreased height and growth in a child? So yeah, there's, there's a lot of data for inhaled corticosteroids and growth in children. And there is a very consistent growth effect that is noted. The magnitude of that effect tends to be quite small on the order of about four tenths of an inch or 1.1 centimeters. And, you know, that's, it's 1.1 centimeters. It's not an awful lot of height that isn't, that isn't a life altering height effect. That isn't a career altering life height effect, but it is clear that it reduces the risk of asthma episodes, systemic corticosteroids and the like. And we know that your cumulative systemic corticosteroid exposure will impact your height, will impact your bone density, will impact your fracture risk. So if, if I had a patient who, you know, the question was, well, is this inhaled corticosteroid safe? I would actually say that it is safer than not using it because the consequences of the rescue therapies and the episodes that come from it actually confer greater risk than does the therapy in and of itself. Well, that's, that's very interesting. Okay, I think this is the last question we have time for. It, it starts out, so Dr. B, have we heard you say that per the 2021 GINA guidelines for youth ages five to 18 or younger perhaps, most of all of our albuterol inhalers can be tossed for new formoterol ICS medications? Um, that's, a, that's a very uh, appropriate interpretation. Um, there's, there's a lot of reason for us to try to think about getting away from albuterol alone. Um, albuterol alone is, is a problematic strategy. First of all, um, when we initially give a person an albuterol inhaler, what do they say? This is the medicine that makes me feel better. So it becomes the go-to medicine for the rest of their disease course. So now when we try to change them to a newer strategy that works better, um, it's very difficult to change that now very established belief. It's very clear that ICS for Motorol is superior to albuterol in nearly every situation in which it's been studied. There are really no situations in which as needed albuterol is better. The only place that we need, we should need albu uh, uh, conventional albuterol going forward is in the status of status asthmaticus. But again, the more we use the as needed ICS for motorol approach, the fewer patients are gonna have exacerbations and the less status asthmaticus we should see. So 
Should albuterol as an inhaler completely vanish from the planet? No, we're still gonna have need for it. In younger children, we still need it. We don't really understand where ICS for motorol fits in. Um, we still have some insurance challenges, some formulary challenges, some pharmacy benefit challenges in the United States for us to work through to figure out how to best utilize this therapy. But from a data-driven perspective, this is the rescue strategy that I think we should be as a community working toward because it clearly provides our patients with the best clinical outcomes. Well, that is a wonderful place to finish. Dr. Picarrier, thank you so much for everything today. Totally appreciate everything you had to share with us. It was so my I pleasure. I wish everybody a wonderful rest of their day. Thank you. Uh, someone did ask me to repeat the website when I was talking about the, the Asthma and Allergy Index. That's our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. So uh, at this time, please download your certificate of attendance from your control panel. If you have any difficulties, please email us using the links in your emails. We're so glad you joined us today. Please join us next month as we look at the question, is it a food allergy or a food intolerance? This webinar will air on Thursday, October 28th at 4 p.m. Eastern and will be joined by Dr. Jay Lieberman. You can register for this webinar on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. You can scroll to the bottom to our, of our homepage to webinars. You can also view our recorded webinars on this page on our website. Visit our website for quality guidelines-based resources on allergy and asthma. Also access important medical information on allergy and asthma from our partners, the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, at allergyandasthmarelief.org. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to having you register to be with us next time on Advances in Allergy and Asthma. This is Sally Schessler for the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network. We're working to breathe better together and manage asthma in the yellow zone. Have a great day. <music>